Welcome back to Story Choices. Today, we are trying something very different. We've been using the coolest new artificial intelligence called ChatGPT. We played around and discovered that it's pretty good at collaborative storytelling. So, we've created a new science fiction episode we are calling Mary Sue and the Tracky Crew. You'll also notice that we've posted some art on this video, which we generated using another popular AI tool, Midjourney. And, you'll also notice that we're using AI tools to create the words you are hearing now. The future is here, people. So, hey race our quirky AI. Induced Star Trek fan fiction. We began by writing the following prompt. In intense and exciting novelization, write the opening scene of a never-before-seen episode of classic Star Trek, featuring Scotty and Mr. Spock. The sentences that are written in green are generated by ChatGPT. The sentences written in blue are written by a lowly human working here at Story Choices Lab. This was so much fun. It felt like playing inside a literary holodeck. And now let's begin Mary Sue and the Trekkie Crew. Captain James T. Kirk stood at the front of the bridge of the USS Enterprise, gazing out at the stars as they flew through space. Behind him, Mr. Spock stood at the science station, his long fingers flying over the controls as he worked. Captain, Spock said, his voice calm and collected as always. I am detecting a distress signal coming from a nearby planet. It appears to be a Federation vessel. On screen, Kirk said, turning to face the view screen. The image of a battered starship appeared, its hull torn and burned. That's the USS Genelin, Scotty said, his Scottish brogue dick with worry as he stood at the engineering station. She's one of our oldest ships. What could have caused this kind of damage? We don't know, Kirk said, his brow furrowed in concern. But we have to find out. Mr. Sulu, set a course for the Genelin. Scotty, ready a team to beam over and assess the damage. I, Captain, Sulu said, his hands flying over the controls. As the Enterprise flew towards the distressed vessel, Kirk couldn't shake the feeling that they were flying into danger. But he knew that it was his duty to help those in need, no matter the risk. Five minutes later, after the distress call is determined to be a false alarm set off by a new recruit on the USS Genelin, the rugged, stubble, ridden face of Admiral Brimbert appears on screen in the captain's ready room. Good to see you, Kirk. As you know, my niece recently graduated from Starfleet Academy. Top honors. She's a genius. But between you and me, she is a bit naive. Of course, what can you expect from a 21-year-old cadet who's never traveled past Jupiter until today? He laughs good-naturedly. Captain Kirk nods, prompting the Admiral to get to his point. Anyway, my niece, Ensign Mary Sue Brimbert, will be replacing your current communications officer, Lieutenant Uhura. I trust that the Enterprise will be the perfect place for Mary Sue to put all of those book smarts to the test. Prepare to have Mary Sue beam aboard as soon as you bid farewell to Uhura. Captain Kirk nods as Admiral Brimbert speaks, taking in the information about Ensign Mary Sue Brimbert. He knows that it is not uncommon for Starfleet to reassign officers, and he is sure that Ensign Brimbert will be a valuable addition to the Enterprise crew. Thank you, Admiral, Kirk says. We will make sure to give Ensign Brimbert a warm welcome aboard the Enterprise. And I will personally see to it that Lieutenant Uhura is given a proper send-off. I knew I could count on you, Kirk, Admiral Brimbert says, a relieved look on his rugged, stubble-ridden face. I'll let Mary Sue know to expect your transmission. Brimbert out. The view screen goes dark, and Kirk sits back into his chair, thinking about the changes that are coming to the Enterprise. He knows that he will miss Lieutenant. Uhura and her professionalism, but he is also looking forward to working with Ensign Brimbert and seeing what she is capable of. Later, Lieutenant Uhura says goodbye to the crew as they meet one last time in the transporter room. Lieutenant Uhura stood in the transporter room, surrounded by her fellow crew members of the USS Enterprise. She had served on the ship for many years, and it was with a heavy heart that she said goodbye. I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for your friendship and support during my time on the Enterprise, Uhura said, her voice choked with emotion. I will never forget my time here, and I will always be grateful for the opportunity to serve with such an amazing crew. Captain Kirk stepped forward, a sad smile on his face. We will all miss you, Lieutenant Uhura, he said. 
You have been an invaluable member of this crew, and your contributions will not be forgotten. We wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Scotty, Mr. Spock, and the rest of the crew nodded in agreement, all of them feeling the weight of Uhura's departure. I will always cherish my time on the Enterprise, Uhura said, looking around at her friends one last time. Live long and prosper. With that, she stepped onto the transporter pad and gave the crew one final smile before disappearing in a swirl of energy. The crew stood in silence for a moment, each of them lost in their own thoughts. Mere moments after Uhura's figure evaporates, there is another energy source lighting up the second transporter disc. With an iridescent cascade of sparkles, the new ensign has arrived. Mary Sue Brimbert has a startled grin on her face as she looks around, blinking at the marvelous technology. It's clear to Kirk and Scotty that this new recruit has never been on a starship like the Enterprise. In fact, this might very well be her first trip on a transporter. Her grayish-blue uniform is a short skirt that matches the dazzling sparkle of her eyes. Her blonde hair, in a proper yet adorable ponytail, is a bit out of place, due to the static charge from a transporter beam. And Kirk, in spite of himself, can't help but notice the young woman has the cutest little nose, the kind that reminds one of a ski jump. Mary Sue straightens her skirt, stands tall, clears her throat, and speaks. Ensign Mary Sue Brimbird reporting for duty, sir, she says, her voice filled with excitement and nerves. Kirk steps forward, a warm smile on his face. Welcome aboard the Enterprise, Ensign Brimbird, he says. I'm Captain James T. Kirk, and this is Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott. We're glad to have you on board. Thank you, sir, Mary Sue says, her eyes shining with gratitude. I can't wait to get started and learn from the best. Well, you're in good hands here, Kirk says, clapping her on the shoulder. I have no doubt that you'll excel on the Enterprise. Let's get you settled in and introduce you to the rest of the crew. As Kirk and Mary Sue make their way out of the transporter room, Scotty watches them go, a twinkle in his eye. He can't wait to see what kind of adventures this new member of the crew will bring. As Kirk introduces Mary Sue to the rest of the Enterprise crew, she can't help but feel a bit starstruck. She has heard so much about each of them and can't believe that she is actually meeting them in person. This is our science officer, Mr. Spock, Kirk says. The ensign gasps. Oh, Mr. Spock, it's a pleasure I mean, it's an honor to meet you. We learned all about your adventures with Captain Pike. I've never met a Vulcan before. I truly admire how logical you are. Period. Period. And how you always control your emotions and how you. Period. Period. Am I talking too much? I probably am. Sorry. It's just, I mean, I can't wait to work with you and the rest of the crew. Spock raises an eyebrow at Mary Sue's rambling but otherwise remains impassive. It is a pleasure to meet you as well, Ensign Brimbert, he says. I look forward to working with you. Mary Sue blushes, realizing that she may have come off as a bit overeager. I'm sorry, Mr. Spock, she says, trying to regain her composure. I just have a lot of respect for you and the work you do. I appreciate that, Ensign, Spock says. And I am sure that you will prove to be a valuable addition to the Enterprise crew. MR, Spock, Kirk says with a wry smile. Why don't you show Ensign around the ship? You can begin by introducing her to her good doctor. I'm sure she'll want to meet Bones, perhaps she'll even deem it an honor. Or was it a pleasure, with a gracious wink to the Ensign? The captain heads to the bridge, leaving Mr. Spock to play tour guide. Mary Sue looks a bit uncertain at the prospect of being shown around by Mr. Spock, but she quickly pushes her nerves aside. She knows that this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to learn from one of the most respected members of the Enterprise crew. This way, Ensign, Spock says, gesturing for her to follow him. Mary Sue falls into step behind him, her eyes wide as she takes in the sights and sounds of the ship. As they walk, Spock points out various points of interest and explains the functions of different systems. Eventually, they make their way to the sick bay, where they are greeted by Dr. Leonard Bones McCoy. Ah, Mr. Spock, Bones says, his southern drawl thick with sarcasm. I see you've brought me a new patient. What seems to be the problem? Dr. McCoy, this is Ensign Mary Sue Brimbert, Spock says, ignoring Bones' teasing. She is the new communications officer on the Enterprise. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, Ensign, Bones says, shaking Mary Sue's hand. Welcome aboard. I hope you won't be needing my services too often. 
I'll do my best to stay out of trouble, Doctor, Mary Sue said with a smile. As the two leave sick bay behind, they enter the turbo lift to engineering. Is Dr. McCoy always that sarcastic around you, Mr. Spock? Mary Sue asks, trying to cut the awkward silence with small talk. I hope his teasing didn't hurt your feelings. Spock raises an eyebrow at Mary Sue's question. Dr. McCoy's sarcasm is a result of our long-standing friendship, he explains. It is not meant to be hurtful, and as a Vulcan, I do not have feelings to be hurt. Mary Sue nods, understanding. I see. It's just that, well, I know that humans and Vulcans can have different ways of expressing themselves, and I didn't want to offend you or anything. You have not offended me, Ensign, Spock says. I appreciate your concern. It is important for us to be aware of and considerate of cultural differences. The turbo lift doors open, and Spock leads Mary Sue into the bustling engineering department. Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott looks up from his work as they enter. Ah, Mr. Spock, and the new lassie, Scotty says, a smile spreading across his face. Welcome to engineering, Ensign. I hope you're ready to get your hands dirty. Mary Sue grins, excited at the prospect of learning from the Enterprise's chief engineer. I'm ready, Mr. Scott, she says. What does this button do? Mary Sue asks as she presses a flashing red button. Ensign Brimbert, I must caution you against pressing unknown buttons on the ship's control panel, Spock says, his voice laced with concern. You do not know the full extent of the consequences of your actions. Mary Sue's eyes widen as she realizes what she has done. I'm sorry, Mr. Spock, she says, quickly removing her hand from the button. I didn't mean to cause any trouble. Spock nods, his expression stern. As I said before, it is important to be aware of and considerate of cultural differences, he says. On the Enterprise, we follow strict protocols for a reason. It is important that you respect and follow these protocols for the safety of the crew and the ship. I understand, Mr. Spock, Mary Sue says, her face flushing with embarrassment. I promise to be more careful in the future. Spock nods, satisfied. Very well, Ensign, he says. Now, if you will follow me, I will continue the tour. But, sir, if I may, continues Mary Sue. You never answered my question. What does that button do? I apologize, Ensign, Spock says. I did not mean to ignore your question. The button you pressed is an emergency shutdown button. It is used to shut down non-essential systems in the event of an emergency, such as a power overload or a hull breach. It is a very important button and should only be pressed in a dire situation. Mary Sue nods, understanding the gravity of the situation. Thank you, Mr. Spock, she says. I won't be pressing any more unknown buttons. I promise. As they walk, Mary Sue makes a mental note to be more careful and respectful of the protocols on the Enterprise. She doesn't want to cause any more problems or put anyone in danger. Wow, says Mary Sue as the turbo lift doors open. Is this the bridge? Yes, Ensign, Spock says as the turbo lift doors open. This is the bridge of the USS Enterprise. It is the central command center of the ship, where all key decisions are made. Mary Sue's eyes widen as she takes in the bustling activity on the bridge. She has seen pictures of the Enterprise's bridge, but being here in person is a completely different experience. Wow, she says, taking a step forward. It's amazing. I can't believe I'm actually here. Welcome to the bridge, Ensign, Captain Kirk says, turning to greet her. I'm glad you could join us. I'm sure it'll be a valuable addition to the crew. Thank you, sir, Mary Sue says, beaming with pride. I can't wait to get started and do my part. I have no doubt that you'll excel, Ensign, Kirk says. Now, why don't you take a look around and get familiar with the layout of the bridge? Mr. Spock, you can continue the tour when she's ready. Mary Sue nods, eager to explore and learn more about the Enterprise. As she looks around the bridge, she can't wait to see what kind of adventures lie ahead. This must be the communications computer, Ensign Brinbert says, careful not to touch several flashing red buttons. Is this where I sit? Yes, Ensign, Spock says, nodding towards the communications station. That is your station. As communications officer, you will be responsible for maintaining communication with other ships and planets, as well as handling incoming and outgoing transmissions. It is an important role on the Enterprise. Mary Sue's eyes light up as she approaches the station. I can't wait to get started, she says, running her hand over the console. 
This is such an honor, Mr. Spock. Thank you for showing me around. You are welcome, Ensign, Spock says. I am confident that you will excel in your new role. And if you have any questions or need any assistance, do not hesitate to ask. Thank you, Mr. Spock, Mary Sue says, turning to the console with a determined look on her face. I won't let you down. Mary Sue takes a deep breath, adjusts her shimmering blonde ponytail, checks to make sure her uniform is showing just the right amount of cleavage, and then sets to work pressing buttons. Suddenly, there's a hum in her earpiece as she receives her first transmission. Captain, we're receiving a message from Starfleet. Our next assignment is to arrive at planet M113 to provide supplies and medical exams for the only known inhabitants of the planet, Professor Robert Crater and his wife Nancy. Mary Sue's eyes light up at the opportunity to be a part of such an important mission. She quickly relays the message to the captain and awaits his response. Thank you, Ensign, Kirk says, a grave look on his face. Inform Starfleet that we will make preparations to depart for planet M113 as soon as possible. And inform the rest of the crew of our new assignment. We have a lot of work to do. Yes, sir, Mary Sue says, already feeling the weight of her responsibilities as communications officer. As the Enterprise sets course for planet M113, Mary Sue can't wait to see what kind of challenges and adventures lie ahead. One hour later, Kirk records a log entry. Captain's log, start at 1513.1. Our position, orbiting planet M113. On board the Enterprise, Mr. Spock temporarily in command. On the planet the ruins of an ancient and long-dead civilization. Ship's Surgeon McCoy and myself are now beaming down to the planet's surface. Our mission, routine medical examination of archaeologist Robert Crater and his wife Nancy. Routine but for the fact that Nancy Crater is that one woman in Dr. McCoy's past. I will be beaming down to the planet with McCoy and the incorrigible new ensign named Mary Sue. As the team materializes on the barren planet's surface, Kirk looks around at the ruins of an ancient civilization. He can't help but feel a sense of awe at the history that surrounds them. Well, this is certainly a long way from home, McCoy grumbles, clearly not impressed by their surroundings. Come on, Bones, Kirk says, clapping him on the shoulder. We've been on far worse planets than this. And besides, we have a job to do. Let's go find the craters and get this medical exam over with. The team sets off, making their way through the ruins towards the craters' makeshift camp. Kirk takes note of the planet's strange terrain. As the team makes their way through the ruins, Kirk takes note of the planet's strange terrain. The ground is rocky and barren, with the occasional patch of sparse vegetation. The ruins of ancient buildings loom around them, their once great structures now reduced to crumbling rubble. Despite the inhospitable environment, Kirk can't help but feel a sense of awe of the history that surrounds them. He wonders what kind of civilization could have thrived in this place, and what caused its downfall. Captain, Mary Sue says, interrupting his thoughts. I'm picking up faint life readings ahead. It looks like it's coming from that direction, she points towards a group of ruins in the distance. All right, let's go check it out, Kirk says, leading the way towards the source of the life readings. As they approach the ruins, they see a small camp set up among the rubble. A man and a woman are sitting by a makeshift fire, their faces turn towards the newcomers as they approach. Professor Crater, I presume, Kirk says, approaching the man. Yes, that's me, the man says, standing up to greet them. And this is my wife, Nancy. Welcome to our humble home. Kirk introduces himself and his team, explaining the purpose of their visit. As they speak, he can't help but feel a sense of unease at the thought of Nancy's connection to McCoy. He knows that it has the potential to complicate their mission, and he just hopes that they can get through it without any problems. Why Dr. McCoy, Ensign Mary Sue whispers to Bones as they watch Kirk fill in the craters. As a communications expert, I can read body language better than a Romulan can chug ale. And your eyes tell me that you're in love with Ms. Nancy. McCoy's face flushes red at Mary Sue's words. I I don't know what you're talking about, Ensign, he stammers, avoiding Nancy's gaze. Mary Sue raises an eyebrow at his reaction. Come on, doctor, she says. It's written all over your face. It's obvious that you still have feelings for her. McCoy sighs, knowing that he can't deny the truth. All right, fine, he says. I won't deny that I still have feelings for Nancy. But it's complicated. We had a history together, 
and seeing her again after all these years is bringing back a lot of memories. I understand, Mary Sue says, placing a comforting hand on his shoulder. But you have to remember that we're here on a mission. We can't let personal feelings get in the way of our duties. McCoy nods, knowing that she's right. You're right, Ensign, he says. I'll do my best to keep my feelings in check and focus on the mission. Of course, Mary Sue adds, playfully patting Bones on the back. When you're off duty, all bets are off. As the ancient proverb says, all is fair in intergalactic love and war. Bones lets out a sigh of relief at Mary Sue's words. Thank you, Ensign, he says. I appreciate your understanding. I'll do my best to keep my personal feelings in check while we are on duty. No problem, Doctor, Mary Sue says with a wink. I'm just here to help in any way I can. And who knows, maybe you and Ms. Nancy will find a way to rekindle your old flame once her mission is complete. Bones shakes his head with a rueful smile. I doubt it, he says. But I appreciate the optimism. The doctor takes a brief moment to compose himself before returning to his professional manner as he greets Nancy, the woman he knew and loved him long years ago. Hello, Nancy, he says, a wistful smile crossing his face. It's good to see you. You haven't aged a day. Thank you, Leonard, Nancy says, a hint of sadness in her eyes. It's good to see you too. I'm glad you're here. Kirk clears his throat, drawing their attention. Mr. Crater, Mrs. Crater, he says, introducing himself and the rest of the team. We're here to provide you with some supplies and perform a routine medical examination. Is there anything you need before we get started? No, we have everything we need, Robert says, gesturing to the camp. Well, if you think of anything, don't hesitate to ask, Kirk says. In the meantime, let's get started on the medical examination. Doctor, if you lead the way. Mr. Crater furrows his brow, waving his hand at them as if waving away a fly. He tells them, rather curtly, Captain, your sense of duty is overwhelming. However, Mrs. Crater and I are perfectly healthy and in no need of an examination. Now will you please go back where you came from and tell whoever issues your orders to leave me and my wife alone? We need salt against the heat. Aside from that, we're doing very well, thank you. Kirk raises an eyebrow with the unexpected response. Mr. Crater, I understand that you may not feel the need for a medical examination, but it is standard procedure for all Starfleet personnel stationed on remote planets. It's for your own safety and well-being. We just want to make sure you're both in good health. Captain, I appreciate your concern, but we are perfectly capable of taking care of ourselves, Mr. Crater says, his tone becoming more stern. We have been on this planet for years, and we have learned how to survive in this environment. We don't need outsiders coming in and telling us what to do. Now, if you'll excuse us, we have work to do. Kirk hesitates, not wanting to cause any further tension. He knows that they are only trying to do their duty, but he also doesn't want to overstep their bounds. Very well, Mr. Crater, he says, trying to be conciliatory. If you change your mind, don't hesitate to let us know. We'll be on standby if you need anything. Oh, but Captain Kirk, Mary Sue exclaims, excited to display her book smarts. Starfleet Code 24601.0 states that all Starfleet archaeologists must comply with an official medical examination at least once a year. It's a requirement. Isn't that right, D.R. McCoy? McCoy nods, impressed by Mary Sue's knowledge of Starfleet regulations. That's correct, Ensign, he says. As Starfleet personnel, it's our duty to follow all regulations, including medical examinations. It's for our own safety and well-being, as well as the safety of our missions. Kirk looks at Mary Sue with a grateful smile. Thank you, Ensign, he says. I appreciate your help. Mr. Crater, it looks like we have a requirement to fulfill. Are you and your wife willing to comply with the medical examination? Mr. Crater hesitates, looking at his wife. After a moment, he nods. Very well, Captain, he says. We'll comply with the medical examination. But please understand that we prefer to be left alone to do our work. We don't need any interference from outsiders. Of course, Mr. Crater, Kirk says, understanding the man's desire for privacy. We'll do our best to minimize any disruption to your work. Doctor, if you lead the way. Meanwhile, following the captain's orders, Ensign Brimbert stands in the midst of the ancient ruins outside of the camp. 
She contacts the Enterprise to send down a crew to assist with the salt replenishment supplies. A tall and lanky crewman named Arnell beams down with a small container which he hands to Mary Sue. Thanks, she says. I'll bring this to Mr. Crater. He seemed very eager for this. He's in the infirmary with the doctor. Wait here, and I'll see if they need anything beamed back. Mary Sue skips across the strange, snot-green sandscape and into the infirmary tent. Inside, she sees no sign of the oddly alluring Nancy, but she finds the doctor scanning Mr. Crater with his medical trick order. Captain Kirk watches from a distance, still wondering what to make of this old archaeologist. I brought the supplies, Mary Sue chirps, handing over a salt shaker. Nancy quickly snatches it up. Thank you, Ensign, Mr. Crater says. We've been having some trouble with the heat on this planet. The salt helps to regulate our body temperature. I see, Kirk says, still intrigued by the strange environment of the planet. Doctor, how is the examination going? Everything seems to be in order, McCoy says, closing his trick order. Mr. and MRS. Crater are both in good health. They just need to continue taking precautions against the heat and they'll be fine. Thank you, Doctor, Mr. Crater says, standing up. We appreciate your concern. But now, if you'll excuse us, we have work to do. Suddenly, from outside the camp, a guttural cry of agony echoes among the ruins. Captain Kirk, without a moment's hesitation, draws his phaser and dashes toward the sound of danger. Mary Sue summons her courage, takes a gulp, and quickly follows. Should I set my phaser to stun, Captain, she calls after him. Yes, Ensign, Kirk says, his voice tense with worry. Set your phaser to stun. We don't know what we're dealing with. Mary Sue cheerfully adds, oh, I also added some special modifications. I can set my phaser to stun, startle, or tickle, which one do you think would work best for this situation? Uh, Ensign, Kirk says, giving Mary Sue a confused look. I'm not sure Tickle is going to be the most effective setting for this situation. Let's stick with Stun for now. Mary Sue nods, a little sheepish. Of course, Captain. Sorry, I just thought it might be useful in certain situations. You never know when you might need a good Tickle to defuse a tense situation. Well, let's hope we don't have to find out, Kirk says. As they reach the source of the sound, they see a strange, humanoid creature writhing on the ground. Its eyes are squeezed shut in pain, and it's making a guttural, animalistic sound. Doctor, can you give us a better idea of what we're dealing with? McCoy scans the creature with his trick order, frowning in concentration. It looks like it's suffering from some kind of poison, he says. I'm not sure what kind, but we have to get it back to the ship. I have the medical supplies we need to treat it there. Very well, Kirk says, holstering his phaser. We'll beam it back to the Enterprise. Ensign, help me get it onto the transporter pad. Captain, look, gasps Ensign Brimbert. The writhing creature stops writhing, and they realize it's not a creature at all. It's Crewman Darnell. He's not moving. Not breathing. His face is blemished by circular sores, each one the size of a Ferengi nickel. From around the boulder, licking salt from her lips, Nancy rushes into McCoy's arms. Oh, dear, she cries. I tried to warn him about the poisonous Borgia plant, but it was too late. Kirk's heart sinks at the sight of the fallen crewman. Bones, do what you can for him, he says, his voice strained. Ensign, get back to the ship and inform Scotty of what's happened. We need to get crewman Darnell back to the Enterprise as soon as possible. Mary Sue nods, her face pale with shock. Yes, Captain, she says, turning to rush back to the transporter pad. As McCoy works to stabilize crewman Darnell, Kirk takes a moment to try and console Nancy. I'm sorry, Nancy, he says, his voice soft. I had no idea this would happen. I should have listened to you. It's not your fault, Captain, Nancy says, her voice trembling. I should have done more to warn him. I can't believe this is happening. What are those sores all over poor Darnell's face, Doctor, Mary Sue marvels. I know this sounds strange to say, but they look like hickeys. McCoy glances up at Mary Sue, a frown on his face. Those aren't hickeys, Ensign, he says, his voice serious. Those are signs of the Borgia plant's poison. It's a highly toxic plant that's native to this planet. If it's not treated in time, it can be fatal. Mary Sue's eyes widen in shock. Fatal? Oh no, that's terrible. Is there anything we can do? I'm doing everything I can, 
McCoy says, his voice strained. But we need to get him back to the Enterprise as soon as possible. I have the medical supplies we need to treat him there. Kirk nods, his face grim. We'll do everything we can to save him, he says. Ensign, inform Scotty of what's happened and have him prepare the transporter. We need to get crewman Darnell back to the ship as soon as possible. I will contact Scotty right away, Captain, Mary Sue says, but she can't help but blurting. However, I did want to let you know that according to my Starfleet Academy textbooks, I believe that planet M113, this very planet, was once the home of an alien known as a salt succubus, a shape-shifting creature that could assume any form and lived on the salt of other living creatures. D.R. McCoy, if my hunch is correct, your trick order will indicate that Darnell's body is currently depleted of salt. Kirk raises an eyebrow with Mary Sue's words, but before he can say anything, McCoy speaks up. A salt succubus? Ensign, I can assure you that there is no such thing as a salt succubus. That's just a myth. Mary Sue looks disappointed, but before she can say anything else, the sound of the transporter beam activating fills the air. Captain, we are ready to beam back to the Enterprise, Scotty's voice says through the comms. Very well, Scotty, Kirk says, turning to Nancy. We'll do everything we can to save Darnell. I promise. With a nod, Kirk leads the way onto the transporter pad, and with a whoosh of sparkling energy, they're beamed back to the Enterprise. As they rush to sick bay, Kirk can't help but wonder if Mary Sue's words about the salt succubus hold any truth. But he pushes the thought aside, focusing on the task at hand, saving crewman Darnell's life. I hope Darnell will recover, Mary Sue says to the captain as they ride the turbolift back to the bridge. I'm sorry if I overstepped my duties. It's just that sometimes I notice things. Like, for instance, did you notice Nancy's odd behavior? Back on the planet, she snatched the salt shaker out of my hand and gobbled every grain of salt. Kirk looks at Mary Sue, considering her words. I didn't notice Nancy's behavior at the time, but now that you mention it, it does seem strange, he says. But we can't jump to conclusions without more information. Let's just focus on getting crewman Darnell the help he needs. We can worry about Nancy's behavior later. As the turbolift doors open, Kirk leads the way onto the bridge. MR, Spock, report, he says, taking his seat in the captain's chair. We are currently on course back to the nearest Starfleet base, Captain, Spock says, turning to face Kirk. DR, McCoy has informed me that crewman Darnell's condition is stable, but he is still in critical condition. The medical staff is doing everything they can to save him. Kirk nods, his expression grave. Thank you, Mr. Spock. Keep me informed of any updates. Later on, in the Starship cafeteria, Kirk is about to take a sip of coffee when Ensign Mary Sue eagerly approaches. P.S.S.S.T. Period. Period. Captain, she whispers. Look over there. Period. Period. Three tables over. It's Nancy and her husband. Mr. Crater is eating a salad. But look what Nancy is eating. A heaping plate full of salt. What do you make of it? Kirk glances over to where Mary Sue is pointing and sees Nancy and Mr. Crater sitting at a table. As Mary Sue pointed out, Mr. Crater is eating a salad while Nancy is digging into a plate of salt. Kirk raises an eyebrow at the sight, but he knows better than to jump to conclusions. I'm not sure, Ensign, Kirk says, turning back to Mary Sue. It's certainly strange, but we can't make any assumptions without more information. Let's keep an eye on Nancy and see if there's anything else out of the ordinary. Mary Sue nods, looking disappointed that Kirk doesn't share her excitement about the strange behavior. Oh, one more thing, Captain, she says solemnly. I heard from Sick Bay a little while ago, she does her best to stifle her tears, but presses on. It's Darnell. Period. 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 He. Period. Period. He. Period. Period. He didn't make it. Kirk's heart sinks at Mary Sue's words. I'm sorry, Ensign, he says, placing a comforting hand on her shoulder. We'll make sure that crewman Darnell's family is notified and that he is given a proper burial. It's a tragic loss, but we must continue to do our duty and honor his memory. Mary Sue nods, wiping away her tears. Yes, Captain. I understand. I'll make sure to send my condolences to his family. Kirk gives her a small smile before turning to leave the cafeteria. As he walks down the corridor, he can't shake the feeling that there is more to the situation on planet M113 than meets the eye.
He resolves to speak with D.R. McCoy and see if he can find any answers. Whistling the theme of his own show, Kirk breezes into sickbay. Doctor, I need to speak with you about what happened on planet M113, Kirk says, his voice serious. Ensign Brimbert mentioned to me that she heard about crewman Darnell's death and it's clear to me that there's more to this mission than we initially thought. Can you tell me more about what happened on the planet? Dr. McCoy looks up from his medical trick order and sighs. I don't know where to begin, Jim. Everything was going fine until crewman Darnell started exhibiting symptoms of severe salt depletion. We tried everything we could to save him, but it was too late. And as for Nancy and Mr. Crater, I'm not sure what to make of their behavior. Nancy's obsession with salt is certainly odd, but I don't have any concrete evidence to link it to Darnell's death. Kirk nods, considering the information. Thank you, Bones. Keep me informed if you find out anything else. In the meantime, I'll see if I can find out more about this salt succubus that Ensign Grimbert mentioned. Kirk's communicator beeps and before he can say anything he hears the frantic voice of Ensign Mary Sue on the other end. Captain, I'm in the guest quarters of Mr. Crater. He's on the floor. And those hickeys or whatever they are all over him. Sir, he's unresponsive. Kirk's heart races at Mary Sue's words. I'm on my way, Ensign, he says, sprinting towards the guest quarters. As he enters the room, he finds Mary Sue standing over the unconscious Mr. Crater, her face pale with fear. Kirk quickly kneels down and checks Mr. Crater's pulse. It's weak, but he's still alive. Ensign, contact Sick Bay and have them send a medical team to Mr. Crater's quarters immediately, Kirk says, his voice calm and steady despite the urgency of the situation. We need to get him to Sick Bay as soon as possible. As Mary Sue rushes to follow Kirk's orders, as Nancy tumbles into the room, rushing into the captain's arms, sobbing, Where is my husband? What's wrong with him? Exclamation mark. Won't someone tell me what is going on? Kirk gently holds Nancy, trying to comfort her as best he can. It's okay, Nancy, he says soothingly. Your husband is being taken to sick bay. I don't know what's wrong with him, but I promise you that we'll do everything we can to help him. As he speaks, a medical team arrives to take Mr. Crater to sick bay. Kirk nods to the team and they quickly load Mr. Crater onto a stretcher and rush out of the room. Come with me, Nancy, Kirk says, guiding her towards the door. We'll go to sick bay and see what we can find out. Everything is going to be okay. That's right, Mary Sue tells Nancy, offering the beautiful brunette comfort. I know this is a very sad and serious situation, but the captain has everything under control, and suddenly, Mary Sue's phaser misfires and a tickle beam zaps Kirk. Kirk's face contorts in surprise as the tickle beam hits him, causing him to double over with laughter. Ensign, what in the world are you doing, he manages to say between fits of laughter. Mary Sue looks mortified as she quickly tries to fix her phaser. I'm so sorry, Captain, she says, her face red with embarrassment. I must have accidentally set it to the wrong setting. I had no intention of causing any distractions during the serious situation. Kirk manages to compose himself, although he can't help but chuckle a little at the absurdity of the situation. It's okay, Ensign, he says, still trying to suppress a grin. Let's just try to keep all phaser beams set to stun for the time being, shall we? Right, Mary Sue stammers, her face red with humiliation. I'll just press this button, she accidentally presses the trigger and the tickle beam blasts Nancy with an uncontrollable jolt of hilarity that reveals the shapeshifter's true form, the salt succubus. As Nancy's laughter echoes through the corridors of the Enterprise, Kirk and Mary Sue can only stare in shock as Nancy's body begins to shimmer and shift. Within moments, the salt succubus stands before them, its true form revealed at last. What in the world, Kirk exclaims, taking a step back as he draws his phaser. It was a salt succubus, Mary Sue says, her eyes wide with amazement. I knew it. I read about them in my Starfleet Academy textbooks. They're shape-shifting creatures that feed on the salt of other living beings. As the salt succubus advances towards them, Kirk quickly sets his phaser to stun and fires, taking the creature down. Good work, Ensign, Kirk says, turning to Mary Sue with a relieved smile. I have a feeling we'll be seeing a lot more of your book smarts in the future. With the salt succubus defeated, the Enterprise crew is able to help Mr. Crater and the other affected crew members, finally bringing an end to the strange events on planet M113. The End
Later that night, Mary Sue decides to visit D.R. McCoy to see how he is doing with this new revelation of the salt succubus Nancy situation. But before she does, she stops by her own room. Now that she is off duty, she can dress in casual attire. She can even have a glass of wine. The closet door slides open with a whoosh and she tries to decide what to wear. As she rummages through her closet, Mary Sue can't help but feel a sense of guilt for what happened on the planet. If only she had listened to Nancy's warnings about the Borgia plant, maybe Croom and Arnell would still be alive. And now, with the revelation of Nancy being a salt succubus, she can't help but wonder if any of her feelings for D.R. McCoy had been genuine or if it was just the salt succubus manipulating him. Shaking off these thoughts, Mary Sue finally settles on a comfortable pair of jeans and a soft sweater. She pours herself a glass of wine and takes a seat on the couch, letting out a deep sigh. It has been a long and eventful day, and she could use some time to unwind before visiting D.R. McCoy. As she sits there, lost in thought, a knock on the door interrupts her solitude. Come in, she calls, setting her wine glass aside. The door opens to reveal D.R. McCoy standing in the doorway, a concerned look on his face. Mary Sue, we need to talk, he says, his voice grave. Of course, doctor, she says, standing at attention. What's the matter? D.R. McCoy takes a seat next to Mary Sue, letting out a sigh before speaking. It's about Nancy. And what happened on the planet? I don't know if you know this, but Nancy and I go way back. We were engaged to be married, but something happened and we ended up going our separate ways. I never forgot about her, though. And when I saw her on that planet, all those old feelings came rushing back. He pauses, running a hand through his hair. But now, with everything that's happened, I don't know what to think. Was any of it real? Or was it just the salt succubus manipulating my emotions? Mary Sue places a comforting hand on D.R. McCoy's shoulder. I understand how you're feeling, doctor. It's a lot to process. But don't lose hope. We'll figure this out together. And in the meantime, it's important to remember that regardless of what happened on the planet, the feelings you had for Nancy are real. They may have been influenced by the salt succubus, but that doesn't invalidate them. You loved Nancy, and that love is still a part of you. D.R. McCoy nods, a small smile appearing on his face. Thanks, Mary Sue. You always know just what to say. And you're right. I can't let the actions of a shape-shifting creature define my feelings. I'll just have to find a way to come to terms with everything that happened and move forward from there. Mary Sue smiles back. That's the spirit, doctor. Now, let's go get some dinner. I heard there's a new chef on board and I've heard great things about his cooking. D.R. McCoy stands, offering Mary Sue his arm. Lead the way, Ensign. And thank you, for everything. Oh, and doctor, she adds with a coy smile. You were right. Those markings are Darnell weren't hickeys, he takes McCoy's palm and presses her lips to the back of his palm, applying a pleasant amount of suction. McCoy, bewildered but curious, allows the moment to pass. Mary Sue makes a little kiss sound and shows him a reddish mark on his warm skin. See, she smirks. That's a hickey. I should have known the difference. Dr. McCoy can't help but chuckle at Mary Sue's antics. I'm glad to see you're still in good spirits, Ensign, he says. This whole situation with the salt succubus and Nancy has been a lot to take in. But we'll get to the bottom of it, don't worry. Thank you, Doctor, Mary Sue says. I just want to help in any way I can. And if that means using my expertise in reading body language and spotting hickeys, then so be it. As they walk down the corridor, Mary Sue offers a bit of advice, as to her succubus friend. And don't forget, Doctor. When one is off duty, anything can happen. And all's fair in intergalactic love and war. Dr. McCoy can't help but shake his head with a smile. Mary Sue certainly has a unique way of looking at things, he thinks to himself. But he has to admit, her enthusiasm and dedication to her work is admirable. Aboard the Enterprise, all is calm. Period. Period. For now. Settling into his quarters and reflecting on the day, Kirk enters yet another captain's log to process the lessons of his latest adventure. Captain's log, supplemental. I have learned a valuable lesson today. One should never underestimate the dangers that can be encountered on even the most routine of missions. The salt succubus, a creature I had never even heard of before, almost claimed the lives of myself and my crew. And the fact that it was able to disguise itself as a trusted member of the team only adds to the danger.
I will make sure to educate my crew on the potential dangers that may be encountered on future missions. I also must commend Ensign Grimbert for her quick thinking and bravery in the face of danger. I am grateful to have her as part of my crew. End log.